Hello and welcome to Chipping In, the latest golf show, podcast, podcast series, whatever you want to call it, brought to you by Fanatics. Um, I mean, there's only one place to start. Let's introduce ourselves. Um, we're a bit, we're going for a bit of light and shade here. We've got, everyone loves golf. It's the amateur side and the professional side. So I'm delighted to say my co-host throughout all of this is Ewan Porter. And Ewan, how I want this to go is a bit like a dating show. You're sort of selling yourself who you are, what's your background, what do you like, what gets you going. So um, I mean, former player, now presenter, commentator. Tell us about your journey. Where did it all start? Well, first of all, you introduced me as a professional. That term can be used very, very loosely. Um, and then you mentioned the dating profile. I met my wife on Bumble and she uh, she laughed at my Bumble profile. It was like a LinkedIn page. <laughs> so I've got no idea when it comes to that. That professional part of it is definitely very loose. But uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, professional golfer for 10 years around the world and uh, some great memories. I'm glad I don't do it for a living anymore because these guys are just way too good now. Um, and then courtesy of the professional golf journey got into the broadcasting some seven or eight years ago now and uh, a pleasure to still obviously be a part of the game and get to travel the world doing something I love and it's a lot easier to talk about six foot putts than it is to actually do it absolutely yeah and it must be funny for you because you got a very recognizable voice walking the fairways the whole time but now you're on camera they're seeing you the whole time so you've picked the what have we gone for the Adam Scott beige was the dress code and I've gone for the sort of um, John Daly <laughs> including the shoes colors I was expecting something a little bit brighter uh, to be honest with you but uh, I'll still pay that off and you've got the shoes made matching the, the shorts as well with that shade of pink in there. But yeah, the, the tanimal look, and it is Ned Bank week in uh, in South Africa too, so it blends nicely. Nicely. Okay, so you, you said a loose professional. You're doing yourself a disservice there. A few wins, two on the Nationwide Tour now, the Corn Ferry, it's been web.com in the US, and also the Muna Classic mm -hmm. on the Australasia Tour, which they are playing again down this week. Um, tell us about some of those, those fond memories and there are a few stories there where you nearly gave up the game and managed to get a win somehow. <laughs> Yeah, and it's something that, uh, to be honest with you, I'm much prouder of uh, now since I've walked away from it. When you're actually playing as a professional, I don't think anything is ever good enough, right? You're always striving for the, for the next thing. Uh, but yeah, got my first win at Moon Eye Links at the age of 25, five years into my professional journey. That set me onto the uh, the nationwide tour, as you mentioned, now the, the Corn Ferry Tour. The second win was probably the win that I'm most proud of because, you know, one win, you tend to feel if you, you, it's, it might be a fluke. You're a little bit lucky. How did I do it? So, But then two, you're sort of, you're, you're proven that you can perform at, at that level and uh, it was at a point where I'd missed the first six cuts in the year. My girlfriend at the time, Annabelle, was a golf pro. We'd, um, we'd moved to Florida and she was uh, supposed to get a teaching job at one of the courses there and uh, it turned out that she couldn't get a visa. I was playing really poorly and we basically thought, we'll stuff this, we're, we're going to head back to Australia and uh, I'll either travel to America from there or I'll go play in Asia. and. Um, I'd played in China the week before this this win in America and missed the cut there. And Annabelle had gone to London um, and got stuck there when the Iceland volcano erupted oh, and yeah. they disrupted travel for a couple of weeks. So I just ended up packing up the apartment in Florida when I travelled back and I was going to play the, the event in Georgia as sort of my swan song. That was it. We were out of there. And um, lo and behold, I won that week. Lower expectations and then... Uh, stayed over there for a couple more years how good i mean that's obviously a career highlight but when you google your name do you know what comes up first the whole time it's a little moment i want to know <laughs> it's a little moment on sports center um that was is it like the worst 10 plays of the week <laughs> the top 10 not so top 10 plays of the week it was my first first year ever playing over there in uh, in 2005 and i was playing in Hudson, Wisconsin. I still remember it. I was going through a really bad patch. Lovely town. Um, which was great town. Um, <laughs> and yeah, going through a really bad patch, which wasn't too uncommon. I'd missed four or five cuts in a row. I was 21, 22 years old. And I came to the 15th hole in the second round and I was right on the cut line. And here we go. You know, I'm finally going to make a cut, cash a check. And then I made a triple bogey on the 14th hole and there were two, 300 people around the green. So I thought, oh, steam's coming out of my ears. I don't want to uh, do anything too stupid here. So I got to the next hole, teed off, didn't think there was anyone watching, slammed my club a few times into the concrete and then helicoptered in, into the jungle, never to be seen again. 
walked with my head down for 10, 15 meters and then looked up and a, a, a camera was uh, capturing absolutely everything. So the next week, that footage obviously got leaked and um, I was on ESPN's top 10, not so top 10 plays of the week, coming in at number eight. And the players thought that was wrong. They thought it should have been number one. And I never got fined for it. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, that was my next question. Okay. And was that was... Quite, that's getting golf in the headlines because there weren't many from golf and there's normally like punch-ons in the NHL, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And NBA yeah. fights and all that. Slam and you lobbing a club into the Bundai. Great. I was the only player. Jason Gore won three times that year and also led the US Open going into the final round. Yet I was the only player from that tour to, to make it to ESPN. So look, to be honest with you, it's, it is a funny story, let's be honest, but it's not something I'm overly proud of and I wouldn't condone it. No, and having known you for a few years now, I don't didn't know you had that side to the pure anger. What, what a game golf is, just brings it out, doesn't it? It is so good. It does, and uh, you know, it's one thing that the young players do pretty well now. They, they keep their emotions in check. Now, I, I don't know how well that translates to an entertainment product on, on television. I think people like to see a little bit of emotion coming out and uh yeah i certainly displayed that on the course i think there were two different ewans on and off the golf course <laughs> yeah right um and through this series then we'll get some plenty more stories you've got you play with everyone because you're doing yourself a disservice to say you played in three open championships mm-hmm. i think is that right yeah, yeah okay yeah. we'll get some stories of those because i think it's some good playing partners as well um my background we met i was european tour now dp world tour either the job in the producing the viral videos which is the worst title anyone's ever given basically as a department where it was all the challenges um 14 clubs um like you actually people recognize me going that shot is on the green that is it and the comedy pieces with McElroy and Ram and on all those people and then we um got together to do a, a podcast mm-hmm. um life on tour where you sort of dug deep with the players and then last year hosted the betting side so that's definitely where my interest is and I'm sure uh, some of the viewers will be interested we'll probably pick a player each week to, to see how they go which leads us nicely um, looking at last few weeks you've been walking the fairways you've moved into this commentary angle um, let's start at the BMW Australian PJ Championship at um, RQ Royal Queensland yeah. Elvis Smiley. It's, it's cool when golf's in Australia. I mean, they come out and support. They would go to the opening of a Coke can, the Aussies. Like, it is so good. This young lefty, um, people are excited by him. What can, you, uh, what can you tell us? You saw him up close and personal. I can tell you a lot. Uh, I've known Elvis since he was 14 years old. And uh, for me, it was probably the most emotional 18th green interview I've ever done with wow. a player, uh, simply because the, the junior golf series that I run um, the Next Gen Amateur Tour. Uh, Elvis hit the first ever shot in that cool. series back in 2019 at Cronulla Golf Club in Sydney, where I grew up. Mm. And uh, yeah, to watch him him on his journey go from elite junior, elite amateur, can't miss kid, to then struggling his first two or three years as a pro, uh, that transition was really difficult for him. And then he's really come into his own the last 12 months. He's got a great team of people around him. Most sports people are well aware of his famous mother, Liz, won four Grand Slam doubles titles. His dad, Peter, a tennis professional as well, grew up in the same area that I did. Does he have any siblings? A bit of pressure on them. Elvis got a couple of sisters, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they live over uh, in the UK as well. But um, yeah, Elvis, he won his first event over a month ago in WA. But to get that win, playing alongside a couple of rippers, Uh, Cam Smith and Mark Leishman, uh, huge crowds, global audience, and so much at stake too. He didn't have an overseas tour card. So all of a sudden, he's got a DP World Tour exemption uh, for the next couple of years. He's over in South Africa now this week. Plans change very quickly, not to mention a bit of a uh, fatter bank balance as well. Yeah, that's that's nice. That bank balance thing's funny, right? Because on the tour side of things, we had this when it was COVID. We started having doing our videos and rooming with the guys, and I remember very vividly. I won't name the player, but you basically get a text of where you finished yeah. and your amount. And we were sitting at dinner, and it just said, "Congratulations, Doctor Law." You've just won 1.2 million US dollars just as, as a text as they won the Abu Dhabi Championship a few years back. Can you imagine just, just look at your phone? Like mine's normally like, you know, failed deposit, you know, like anything like that. That is like you've won 1.2 million and we just dinner's on you, mate. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's not something that I'm familiar with either. And, uh, you, you know, you referenced I'd, I was lucky enough to have a couple of wins. I mean, the prize money on that tour was worth a tenth of that. But I still certainly felt like I was a millionaire winning those. But, yeah, it's more... These days, it's more akin to parking fines, yeah, etc. Absolutely right. Um, as you say, you held off um, a couple of the live guys and Leishman and and Smith. That was very impressive. Did you expect it? Because it is really hard making that journey, isn't it? When you're the next big thing, and then actually 
delivering on that. We've seen that a bit with Ryan Ruffles as well, yeah. Aussie Golf. Um, was it called Mr. 57 or 58? Whatever, he went very low. Yeah. Um, did you expect Elvis would be able to finish like that or not? Um, I expected Cam Smith to win, yep. um, but it didn't surprise me that Elvis held on. And I think he, he showed straight out of the gate why uh, why he is going to be so good because he is so poised. He birdied the first two holes um, really when that's probably the part of the round where you could easily capitulate at the very beginning. Um, he showed no signs of nerves and um, led all day long. Yeah, awesome. And he kept the form going the following week and the big one, the Aussie. Um, it's, it's been a couple of weeks of incredible names. We've got Elvis going well. And then we've got the winner in Aussie, Riggs Johnston. Now, no one knows much about world 960-odd American guy named after the character in uh, Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Mel Gibson's character, yeah. Uh, extraordinary name. And he, um, he got it done the following week um, up against Curtis Luck was another big name sort of um, who's coming through the ranks Aussie um, you are heard your dulcet tones walking the fairways and doing a lot of the female side of the tournament as well um, what can you tell us about Riggs um, it's a great name but anything else he's from Libby Montana which is 50 miles south of the Canadian border and when I stopped playing I worked at a brewery in Montana for just over six months and okay. uh, it's a it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, there's pretty much nothing going on in Libby, Montana. I know it was minus 12 degrees Celsius when he was tapping in to win. And to be honest, the last day in Melbourne felt like a similar temperature as well um, with the wind and the rain. But it, 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 I don't even think he probably realises what he's achieved. Uh, you look at the, the names on that trophy, everyone from Norman to Nicholas to, yep. to McElroy and Spieth in recent times. And Riggs Johnston has uh, joined that list. And I don't think he travelled outside of America up until a month ago. He went to Spain, Amazing. got his DP World Tour card. Then he went to Australia. Now he's in South Africa. It's been quite the journey for the young man. Unbelievable. And yeah, and we'll go on to South Africa shortly because there are some big named Americans joining him there. But it could be uh, the start of something special for him. Now, there were quite a lot of comments. And the good thing about you being freelance now and myself um, basically being fun employed, we can say what we want and no one cares. So um, let's talk a bit about the format because it did get a little bit of criticism and golf in general I think um, doesn't do it that well and that's why some people welcome live it was something a bit different I mean I'm a very much an amateur club golfer and every week it's just staple food they don't mix it up too much becomes repetitive mm. what did you sort of take on the whole the whole week and then and, and how they approached it yeah uh, it was in the headlines I think for all well, the wrong reasons you could maybe say the, the format with the men and the women and they've tried something different each and every year the last three years that they've been doing the mixed national opens uh, two years ago at Victoria Golf Club when it finished calling it as it is it was an absolute shambles when we finished in three consecutive groups you had the all abilities finished then you had the women's group then you had the men's as they walked off the 18th green Todd Woodbridge was interviewing the winner and that meant that when he was interviewing the winner that group behind couldn't hit their shot into the green, which then caused backups, bank ups behind, but also meant that with only so many cameras, you missed a lot of shots coming down the stretch. Grace Kim two years ago had to make a birdie to force a playoff. The first shot you saw of her on the final hole was in a greenside bunker. Nobody knew whether it was her third, fourth or fifth shot. Turns out it was a fifth because she'd had trouble back in the trees wow. and nobody knew that. So obviously you can't afford at any stage during the tournament, particularly the climax for that to happen. This year, the women certainly, and I think justifiably, felt like they played second fiddle to the men. Why is that? Because the final group went out two hours before the final group of the men. So, yeah. you know, they didn't have they didn't have the crowd with them. The crowd were all with the men. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great tournament. You had a great winner in G.A. Shin and Ash Buhai almost winning... Uh, three in a row, but um, I think, and we can potentially tap more into this, but uh, I, I definitely believe that both the men and the women deserve their own respective events. Yeah, absolutely. That has been a bit of criticism with Liv as well, isn't it? That the shotgun start, a winner can be in front of no one on the fifth green and you have no idea what's going on. Um, nice segue there, Ash Boy, South African. We're in Ned Bank. You're dressed as a safari host um, beautifully for, the, for this week at the Gary Player course. Um, uh, what are you expecting? Because this is always a fun event. I did a few of these. Um, I remember one video we did bad coaching yeah. um look it up on youtube if you haven't seen it where basically we got martin keimer podrick harrington ian poulter and westy to give because it's a professional telling you mm. they gave advice that was so bad to punters that they're like oh i believe it's great so yeah. i think martin keimer was 
shut your eyes and swing. That's how I always practice. <laughs> Ian Porter said, I swing so hard on the range, I let go of my club just to really get my hips through. I remember that. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was great. And yeah. it's safari as well, isn't it? There's mongoose coming, running through, nicking your balls. There's all sorts of, the big five are basically yeah. on the course. And I think what you just said about those, those players buying into it, that's the great thing about the DP World Tour, right? They all buy into the product and I think that's why it is so entertaining but I my memories of the Ned Bank going back 25 30 years it used to be a 10 or 12 man field back before they did anything like that in professional golf it was a very elite event with a huge purse it was a bigger purse than anywhere in the world but it was also a sort of a fun end of season event and um I remember one year Robert Allenby the Australian was sponsored by the Hyatt Regency Coolum up mm. in Queensland and that week in Queensland was the Coolum Classic. It clashed with the Ned Bank Challenge. So, of course, Coolum being a sponsor of Allenby said, you need to play our Coolum Classic. And Robert said, well, hang on. If I win the Coolum Classic, I get 30000 Australian dollars. If I go to Ned Bank and I come last, I get 100000 US dollars. I'm going to go to Ned Bank. And he actually went and won it. Uh, yeah, from memory and got over a million dollars when no one was offering that money and he lost his Coolum contract but I don't think his <laughs> bank balance or bank manager was too worried. No, I wouldn't say so. And the event itself is one of the great ones. Actually, Fanatics, you know well, sports in your travel company for just people who are mad about travel, sport, entertainment, events, I mean, merchandise, everything. Um, it's a place to go because at Sun City, there are four hotels. The players are in the palace. Everything's gold. There's just heads of every animal you can imagine in the dining room, all the way down to the fourth hotel where we were basically a lovely shanty town um, where we stayed as staff, which is fantastic. <laughs> but the, the big thing there is, I don't know if you spent the casino and Vibes nightclub, mm -hmm. which is where you see the players who missed the cut on Friday <laughs> having a great time with their caddies. It's almost like the uh, the Dunhill links and Marbells behind the 18th green at St. Andrews. You know those players had missed the cut because uh, you'd see them at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. But when it comes to travel, I mean, it's, it, it's got something for everyone, right? It's a family destination. They've got that massive... Massive pool there, shopping, food, wine, and affordable. It's yeah. great. And you do safari at 5 a.m., and then you've made it first tea time, a couple of courses there at Lost City. Um, it is a, is a good time. There are some good names in the field this week, some big Americans there who obviously aren't going over to the hero. We've got Corey Connors, or um, well, Canadian, obviously, Max Homer and Will Zalatoris. Yeah. Um, some big names. If you had to pick one, um, them, or from the field, who, who's going to go well and this is going to suit them, who, um, who are you looking at this week? Um... I don't expect any of those players you mentioned to go that great simply because they don't have the reps. Uh, they haven't played for a couple of months since the PGA Tour ended. There's one player from Denmark that's really stood out this year, and that's Nicholas Norgard. Yep. Uh, he's a winner on the DP World Tour, and uh, he's the longest on the DP he's World Tour. That video the other day, 197 mile per hour or something speed, just he's a freak. And it's effortless power. It doesn't yeah. look like he goes at it that hard. But the Danes, the Scandinavians in general, have really come to the fore the last few years. And whatever they're doing behind the scenes uh, in their training camps as juniors or amateurs should be replicated around the world. But Nicholas Norgard, look out for him. He'll be a multiple winner. Yeah, I, funny you say that. I was, this is random, I was in Monaco last week, just at a random bar. Of course you Someone were, walks through. I'm like, Lordy? Gareth Lords there. He lives in Monaco. And this is, of course, the old caddy of Henrik Stenson. And I say old because mm. he texted him last week and he's just signed. And he's Nikola Hoygaard's new caddy going forward. I know, that's oh, breaking. Wow. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I've said it. So yeah, he doesn't wow. watch it. There Literally you go. Sitting breaking news. He lives in Monaco. So he's taking his bag for the inn. He said that's a pretty fun for 14 events. But that's a big signing for Hoygaard in the Ryder Cup year. Oh, yeah. Up. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good bag to get on as well. And yeah. his brother Rasmus, they'll be playing on the PGA Tour next year. Good yeah, lads. Um, I just I just tapped into like how what was live like because obviously Henrik Stenson was Ryder Cup and I worked on the team Europe for a few Ryder Cups. Um, he was Ryder Cup captain for about a week before he said he's gone to live and, and lost that whole thing. And he said it was interesting, but God, it was you guaranteed basically what was it 125 thousand for coming. People being Pat Perez coming last every week, basically. <laughs> Not bad uh, work for a caddy, is it? <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, they were treated quite well out there. And again, um, it's something that I witnessed when I was out on, on tour. Caddies were treated as uh, second-class citizens. They, they were not allowed to mingle with the players. They couldn't go into the locker rooms. The food they were served was, was terrible. Yep. Um, and the pay, really not that great. So if you're a caddy, it's just a win-win being out there and live. Totally. Unbelievable. I mean, bags are heavy, though. I remember Tyrrell Hatton's caddy for uh, having 25 kilos in his back. And one event he pulled out because basically too many undulations. It was genuinely like hurt him too much to do it. Like, yeah. It's a proper workout. Absolutely. It is six hours, 10 miles, heat. Yeah. Why is it six hours? Like all they do is hit fairways and greens, bros. Mm. Like I'm hitting, I'm battling to break 90. 
I don't have we got long enough. We could do an entire <laughs> podcast on slow play. We all going to get does on, my head in. We are going to get on things we hate. What would change about the game? Um, but we'll do that in a minute. Speaking of money, live. Let's quickly go over to the PGA Tour. RSM Classic. Maverick McNeely won. Now I say money. This guy plays golf. His dad sold out his company for seven point seven billion a few years it's, ago. It's silly, isn't it? Yeah. Like he doesn't need it. He doesn't. He doesn't have the same pressures. There was a story I think I, I saw on Twitter X of him uh, at the same tournament six seven years prior, missing out on a mon- in a Monday qualifier, and of yeah. of course it hurts. You want to achieve uh, what you can, but it, it's not the same for him as it is other players and and yours truly as well. When you miss a Monday qualifier and you look at your bank balance and you've got forty five dollars in there and you wonder where you're going to stay that night, it's. Uh, yeah, not quite the same hardships. No, it's a nice problem to have, but he, he did well out there. Obviously, um, George Away is an RSM Classic at Sea Island. Um, he got it done. Dan Berger was the name who was up there who's had his injury struggles. Um, and then this week, it's, you see some interesting new names on that leaderboard. You go to the big names. Hero this week. Tiger's sort of event in out Albany and uh, Bahamas. Um, Scotty Scheffler, is it $3 favourite? <laughs> I think I saw. I thought it might be like $1.04, $1.05. He pretty much wins every event he tees it up. Yeah, have you ever been over there? Ever done this event? No, anything? No. no, not done the Bahamas. No. Okay, interesting. No. What can we expect from from that field? Because it's it's very impressive, and I think his form was second, second, first in his three goes here. Yeah, Justin Thomas fifth, 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 third, something similar as well. Yeah, well, name. Justin Th- Justin Thomas is playing alongside Keegan Bradley, a mm-hmm. resurgent Keegan Bradley over the last couple of years. I think he's top two or top three in the Ryder Cup points list, and he's the Ryder Cup captain. Yeah. next year that would be an interesting uh, predicament. But I think he said that he's you know as a captain he's doing it regardless of how his form is but I think uh, Keegan uh, is definitely sort of a a smoky if you'd like to call it for this week and Jason Day's playing Jason Day finally teed it up in Australia after a seven-year hiatus seven years wow in in Queensland a couple of weeks ago and uh, he's copped a lot of criticism on social media for that but being there he's a crowd favorite and he he's a good guy Jason um we're calling a spade a spade once again. I don't yeah. think his wife likes him traveling. And he's got uh, yep. he's got five kids, but it was good for him to see his family and uh, and get back. Hopefully he does it again in yeah. the future. Uh, caught criticism for that and also his dress code a lot as well with the Malbon partnership. There are some, I mean, I can't talk right now, mm. but there are some outfits he's rocking, aren't there? Yeah, there are. What was it, the Masters? The yeah. uh, He got turned away, he got told to take his, his vest or his, or his yep. jumper off or something. And then, he's, and then it went on eBay and someone paid a mozza for it. <laughs> yeah. No, it must be nice. I love that you you're a major winner and you get turned away from Augusta and <laughs> outfits. Yeah, nice. Um, he speaking of five children, someone in the news and people have been talking about this. Tony Fee now, mm. He's just pulled out the event and it looks pretty likely he's off to live. Well, him and John Rahm are best mates. There was speculation it was going to happen less than twelve months ago. Yeah. Um, and there's a spot there because was it Kale Samuya? Um, yep. was on the was it Legion. Legion 13, is that right? Um, yeah, the catchy names, aren't they? Legion, <laughs> Legion, <laughs> Legion 13. He, he got dropped from the 12, first 12 Legion teams that's and he's right. picked 13. Yeah, that's right. He's out of the captain's 12. So he's <laughs> uh, yeah, he's out. There's a spot there. There'll be a lot of movement. And I think, you know, it's, it's copped a lot of criticism over the last uh, year or two. Yeah. Uh, the, the team format but I, I do think in five to ten years I think it'll be more heavily supported and I think each team will be going all in on their on their branding and we'll see things from podcast to merchandise and I think at, at tournaments you're going to have a, a lot of significant rivalries in years to come and um, Tony Fino, I wouldn't to be honest it wouldn't surprise me if anyone joined live the way it's the way it's okay looking. that was my next question because no. I know the guys pretty well from um, the content grabs I did you know them has there been a name that you were surprised with? for me it was really only Cam Smith because of his comments well, a year previously when he said I think he won the players what are you gonna do to spend the money he said I'll oh, just go fishing I don't need yeah. any more money everyone else were coming sort of twilight their careers your Stensons your Porters your Westwoods mm-hmm. um, what do you make of Live overall and are you surprised by anyone who's, who's jumped over I think it's it's growing as a product I think it's growing and I think all the hoopla around it is is starting to die down a little bit and obviously there's speculation at the moment about Live and the DP World Tour coming yes. together and yeah. uh I personally think that would be great because, in my opinion, I don't see anything wrong with the PGA Tour being American-centric. That's absolutely fine. Play in America. Um, If you aspire to play there as an international, great. But I think all the rest of the world needs to figure out how to get together and make it work. And with the DP World Tour and, and their alliance with the PGA Tour of Australasia, live and their Asian connection. If they can all work together, you'll have a truly global tour with a bit of Saudi money behind it. And it'll be somewhere that 
I think everyone, and youngsters especially, will aspire to play. Yeah. Would you have done it? Live come calling would, after you got your big win at the Mooner Links? Would you have gone, all right, Riyadh, I'll, I'll come over? Yeah, absolutely I would yeah. have. And I don't, I don't think they were ever going to come calling after that win. It was a good win, but I don't think the Saudis were watching or are watching yeah. but, um, or care about me. But Yet. Uh, Yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, how could you not? Uh, yeah. I think you'd be, you're lying through your teeth if you said you wouldn't consider it. Yeah, okay. And I also find it quite funny or, or different that players, you talk about PGA Tour, very US-centric, um, and that's all you play. I like the model, the guys, your Peter Ulines, your Brooks Koepkas, who did the Challenge Tour, DP World Tour, European Tour back in the day, and then spent a bit more time there because there's only so many times you want to play in Wyoming. But I remember mm-hmm. having to eat horse meat, you know, and the guys talking about in Kazakhstan Open uh-huh. on the Challenge Tour. Uh-huh. Slightly different uh, journey, but you actually travel the world, not just the You do. States. I had horse sashimi in Japan three weeks ago. It was the first time I'd ever had it with um, a little bit of horse radish, and it was actually fairly bland. <laughs> really? Yeah. It, okay. Yeah, I, we went into a little teppanyaki joint. I was over there commentating at the LPGA event. I wasn't the only one to, to try it, but... Yeah. Did was, you know you were trying it? I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if Brooks and Co. in Kazakhstan knew they were knew they were doing it, but you're right. No. Um, I remember seeing a video of Brooks in India in a tuk-tuk hosting a, a challenge to a weekly show yeah. or something, and he actually uh, had quite a bit of personality uh, back then. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure he still does somewhere, but then that's a, that's a greater story, uh, an even bigger story, right? I mean, you could talk about... And I'm sure we could touch upon the the Bryson thing and and you know him over the last year or two being yeah. able to open it up open up. But I agree with you, Greg Norman, Adam Scott, they all started playing in Europe and then progressed to the US. And uh, I like the idea of doing that. Yeah, nice. You you mentioned the Bryson thing. That was my my next note there. Um, he has just become the most like for the amateur golfer. He's the guy, isn't he? The 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 this whole YouTube content creation side of things. He's taken over. And this week, it's been his challenge of getting a hole-in-one over his house. I also read his house is only $1.5 million, which is extraordinary given he's worth $100 yeah, million. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I think maybe, <laughs> nice. yeah, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago it was worth that. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, look, I, I think understandably people were sceptical at first about Bryson when he went to live and then created his own YouTube channel and became this personality, so to speak. Well, yeah. well is, is it for show? But it, it's it's gone on so long now and to, and to do it at a US Open and it was really he was calling it the People's US Open because he celebrated with the people with the fans yep. and uh, he made it feel like they were all part of the journey with him and you can't fake that and especially to win a major championship down the stretch against Rory McIlroy you cannot fake that mm, speaking of faking it though you know these guys pretty well his whole thing with Brooks years mm. back was that ever fake has it been to do storylines because it, it feels a bit YouTube-y in any other word you know the sort of Logan Paul models and you start rivalries and they start selling things do you think they ever really didn't get on or what did, what did you make of it all I had a bit of a first-hand insight into it all because it all started at Liberty National in the Northern Trust uh, just outside New York City in 2019 and uh, I was doing the uh, I was doing the on-course reporting for Justin Thomas Tommy Fleetwood Bryson DeChambeau and Bryson on the seventh hole took two and a half minutes to hit a five or six foot putt and I'm standing there next to the green calling it. Um, I don't think he could hear me, but I basically said something along the lines of, I'd love to see Bryson just play nine holes with his mates and have some beers and not take any time because this is ridiculous. Tommy and Justin had both walked off the green. Anyway, the clip went viral. Of so you him said taking, this on air. Yeah, the love clip it. went viral of him taking two and a half minutes and he copped abuse Eddie Pepperell gave it to him and <laughs> uh, and then uh, Brooks Kepka came out in the press conference later that day and said how selfish it was and then Bryson said something to um, Ricky Elliott Brooks's caddy the next morning when I was standing on the range 30 feet away saying if Brooks has got something to say say it to my face so then Brooks arrived said it to his face Brooks is towering over him really and anyway I don't think there was ever any um, chance of it coming to fisticuffs but that was authentic that part of it was real what happened two years later at Kiowa with the whole mm. eye roll I'm, yeah I'm not I'm not sure about that but uh, they've played it up pretty well what stage of Bryson was that was that skinny flat cap wearing or jacked up might might fight him might fight 20, pr- 2019 was skinnier yeah. I don't think he was ever well, he was skinny He's, as, a, as yeah. a college kid wasn't he yeah. he wasn't skinny in 2019 but by so 20, Brooks wins that one Brooks wins Brooks, Bro- I, Brooks wins all the time I don't think Bryson could fight his way out of a wet paper bag. I really don't. <laughs> no. 29, I think that's when um, we were speaking a bit earlier. 
Dubai, which is kicks off the year again at the Emirates Golf Club. I remember, I think it was Golf Digest did a video on Bryson. This was when he was the mad scientist and he won before and it was all the same clubs and mm-hmm. swing perfect. And they did a video walking down the range going one word to describe Bryson. I cannot believe this is still on YouTube. I think on Twitter as well somewhere. I would say only 10 players' words were allowed to be used, basically. <laughs> he was not the most popular man. He basically said, you're all idiots. Golf is mass. How are you getting it wrong? Yeah. And like, I've cracked the code. Yeah. Well, w- wild. I think he's become more popular over the last two or three years. And, and I, I think the other thing with the with the live circuit, right, is they're, they're traveling as a, as a team. They're traveling as a touring circus 14 times a year. And um, I think everyone, whilst they're on different teams, I think that everyone does appear to to get along pretty well now and um, I think that I think the tour itself has brought it more together as a family than what the PGA Tour was yeah absolutely right did, we, did you do Adelaide last year at all for the for the live side because no. no. talk about pod that's um there's a lot of guys out there who are doing their golf trips they're putting them in the diary now and they put that event on Valentine's Day I noticed yep, yep. my yeah. brother-in-law might be in a bit of trouble for uh, <laughs> heading there with his mates for a few days so you're doing the whole come on honey let's go down to Barossa let's try some oh god there's a golf tournament on yep. I had absolutely no idea but isn't that isn't that the great part about it I mean Adelaide cops a fair bit of flack for being Adelaide but um, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's a it's a really good sporting town yep. it's a it's a, it's sneaky good when it comes to the quality of golf courses and the food and the wine you've just you've mentioned and uh, yeah. it's a great place to go for a few days totally a good tangent I mean that's at the Grange I'm wearing Royal Adelaide um, mm-hmm. which we did last year because um, as we record this the test match is on um, yep. in a couple of days and it's brilliant it's the night test so you can wake up 8 a.m play a round of golf and you don't miss a ball of the cricket. Are those Adelaide Oval sunsets, are they the best? Are um, there, there any I don't best? know if I've ever seen one. Um, I just, you know, just looking straight, <laughs> but they sound nice. <laughs> it sounds They're like really good, on, on, on the hill, under the scoreboard. It's beautiful. Proper, oh, yeah. Mm. Um, and you, I'm sure if you watch Chin Music as well, one of the shows um, on Fanatics TV, they'll be dissecting all of that um, as well uh, with Moises and Tom Gallup. Um, Australia needs to get a win to make, you know, get mm. one all because India really pumped them in the first in that Perth. That was a disgrace. <laughs> Are you following your cricket? I do. Do you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're saying was... you were at school with Moises, but just a couple of years older. Yeah, we'll we'll call it a couple. <laughs> yeah, maybe seven or eight. But yeah, they actually Endeavour Sports High down in the Shire mm-hmm. and um, down Cronulla Way in the south of Sydney. They named the field after him as well. Oh, yeah, he's too modest to admit that. Tables. Do you yeah. say it's called Endeavour Sports High? Mm-hmm. That's quite like a particip- participation award, isn't it? Endeavour Sport, like they're bloody trying at sport. They're endeavouring, but they're, they're no good. I yeah, like I like the, I like the way you've put that. But 1995, my first year of um, high school. That's how yeah. old I am. Yeah, that yeah. was the first year it became a sports school. They've actually had a lot of success, mainly in rugby league, um, over the years. But uh, other sports becoming uh, pretty prevalent now. Simon Cowley was a he was in the cricket. Um, team there in 1995 won a Commonwealth Games swimming medal in 1998 right gold medal so um, yeah Tell us. good school there you go yeah. okay nice uh, we mentioned there Bryson hitting it over his house some of this show uh, we're mixing up between professional and amateur there's a lot of people who basically love golf and we've seen that from COVID the wait list on every course they took it up because it's all you could basically do in your LGAs in uh, Australia um, in England so there's people who just tune in basically for majors only and they just want to play and do the boys trips yep. each week we're going to get a little tip from you or a little you know you know, you, I've seen Pretty you still you still play on, on Instagram you what do you do? you go around playing with antique clubs which are bloody hard to hit essentially right retro clubs yeah, yeah, yeah. How, wh- how do you get into that and collecting those yeah, during uh, during COVID, I went down a uh, dark hole on on eBay purchasing retro clubs, retro golf balls, uh, retro clothing uh, as well, and uh, then that that continued for a little while, much to my now wife's dismay. Um, there wasn't enough room for it in our shoebox apartment yep. uh, here in Sydney. But um, no, it's look, it's good fun, and it's actually something I say to a lot of the elite kids coming through is it, it's good training it, it's good to go out there and learn how to hit the old equipment because it really you know in layman's terms it makes the makes the modern equipment seem pretty pretty damn easy to hit yeah absolutely i remember at gullen there was a scottish open a few years ago we did a hickory challenge so you hit the old clubs they're like this big this thin um and it's actually sort of about patrick reed wildly unpopular right mm. but he um there's a guy there who sells only anti-club boris mm-hmm. uh, a of course it was Boris. Yeah, of course it was. Was that in that golf shop in the town of Gullen? I've, exactly, I've been in there. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. He just sells this. A German guy, real eccentric. Patrick Reed after the shoot, it was nearest the pin. He um, basically stiffs it and he's like, I love this. Where did you get this club? And I went, oh, there's a, unbelievably, there's an antique golf shop in town. He goes in there with no cameras and says, can I have a set to Boris? Who he would openly admit, you know, sells a three a year. 
um, and struggling. And Patrick Reed goes in, says, I'll have a whole set. I think he asked for basically free or says, give me a plug on socials or whatever. And I think Patrick Reed hands over somewhere between ten and 15,000 pounds for this, just to help out this struggling set and took it home and fell in love. And that's a good story. You never hear about sort of Patrick in that side. He's just uber competitive, basically. And that's yeah. what you see on the course. But off the course, he loves that um, that, that side of Sandy Lars, another one who enters the yep. Hickory World Championship. It's... Um, I mean, for the amateurs, probably don't try it because it's bloody hard, but it is good fun, right? Well, Warren Smith, who hosted the last two weeks, he's a member of the Australian Hickory Society, and I've used his clubs a couple of times. and it, It's fun. It, yeah. it really is fun. Even last year, one of my colleagues, uh, John Morgan, uh, oh, yeah. on-course commentator, he owns Joe Powell Golf Worldwide, which was a big company back in the 70s and 80s. During the Pro-Am at the Scottish Open, he at the Renaissance Club, he had, uh, he had his Joe Powell Persimmon driver on the tee when Rory came by. Rory hit the driver with a track man um, behind the tee there. Rory then tweeted it, and within 24 hours had over 2 million views. Nice little plug for Joe Powell Golf. How did, how, yeah, very nice. How did Rory hit it? Because some pros struggle with their swing. It's different, right? Uh, um, John Rahm hit it at the Wentworth this year, and um, he, he hit a big old 50-yard slice off the first tee, which you don't see with the modern equipment. Yeah. Rory actually hit a really good one. But the, the cool thing about it was having the track man behind the tee and having the numbers and there was a 21 mile an hour club head speed difference there was i think a 1500 rpm if you understand that side of it um spin difference and i think in ball speed it was over um 20 miles an hour as well so there is a significant difference yeah i love that because there are amateurs watching this and they know their numbers for no they're going to the golf sims and trying all these numbers but have no idea what actually equates to it it matters you just you just want to see what yours is compared to the pros you don't know what it means no exactly right distance so with the tip, right, if you are watching Bryson and you want to hit a wet, what was the distance on that? It was 100 and something yards, wasn't it, over his house into the hole in one I saw? 80, was oh, was it? 84. 84, okay. Yeah. So um, what's your one tip if you're speaking to an amateur and they're going to try this at home, they're going to hit a flop shot essentially over their entire house. How do you make sure you don't knife it or scull it through the front window? <laughs> Oh gosh, that's that, a, is a, uh, that is a problem for a lot of amateurs. They're trying to hit that big up and under for no reason. Yeah, first What's of something? all, don't try it. Um, <laughs> I think that's the number one tip. Uh, secondly, always club up. Always take one extra club. That's just not with wedges. That's every club through the bag. Too many amateurs think they're heroes, and uh, you know, I hit a oh, I hit a wedge there. What did you hit? Take one extra club, um, but good balance. Keep your head still and good balance. Because if you don't keep your head still. If it goes up or down or you look up or whatever it is, that affects contact. And, of course, if you're hitting over your house, you want good contact, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if you are trying this at home, guys, Instagram and Facebook, at The Fanatic, send it in. We would love to see the videos. Talk us through what club you're using, the distance, yeah. their own sort of... Um, there's a few people have started building little greens in their backyard. My brother-in-law is one of them. Absolutely loves it. Um, I'd pay to watch that. Well, I love this idea because we can then dissect the technique and everything and we'll just become the new uh, Max Homer. We'll uh, roast everyone, right? I was about to say, oh, I don't think I can roast <laughs> anyone i had i had my first real lesson a few weeks ago um and i'm an average seven handicapper i know and he said i literally cannot help you like you are you'll be back at 36 if we redo all of this and that was it and watching back the video it's vile like it's genuinely nauseating what did he say you can when you strike it you can pound it out there yeah we've played a couple times yeah Yeah. when it's a big if and if and (laughs) uh, if and when um absolutely social media is great there's like my love of golf is just the memes every time. The one that always goes round is, you know, the the best mate who um, who's playing golf. And he says, if my wife messes you, can you tell, you know, that golf takes nine hours because you got four <laughs> hours playing, five, five in the bar afterwards. Mm-hmm. Did you see the story about the English guys smuggling this week that's gone viral? Oh, I've heard about it, but you'll have to l- elaborate. It's pretty... Cl- clever or stupid? I don't I, know. I don't know. So for two... It was on CBS, I think, in America, but there's mm. two guys in the UK who have now smuggled $4.9 million US dollars of cocaine through the shafts of their golf clubs back and forth from the the UK to different countries. Is that not one of the most creative ways you thought of using basically a golf club? And how would you go swinging with 
that extra weight in your golf yeah, club. Yeah, I don't think it's enough really to to affect it too much. But um, the one thing you don't want to do is hit a bad shot and snap snap your club over your knee, right? <laughs> no, that that is very true. Did you have that happen to you, or there was something about that Ned Bank with a putter? I remember a, a, a club snap. Speaking of the Ned uh, Bank, ah, yeah, 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 a good point. Uh, Mark McNulty, uh, old Zimbabwean mm-hmm. player, but uh, known as the greatest putter of all time, playing the Ned Bank back in the in the eighties, and uh, one of his compatriots, good friend of his, Dale Hayes, who I've had the good fortune of commentating with, legendary South African golfer, walks onto the tee. Mark McNulty uh, used to use a bullseye putter, and for those unfamiliar, it's uh, it's a put- It's one of those putters you can putt right or left-handed with. Doesn't affect it. And um, Dale walked onto the tee and said, "Oh, hey, Mark, this is your this is your favourite putter, isn't it?" Mark said, "Well, yeah, yeah, yeah." Dale takes it out, promptly snaps it over his knee, and McNulty's just in absolute shock and horrified at what he's just seen. But what Mark didn't know was that Dale had actually taken that good putter, put it in his own bag, and swapped it out for something that looked exactly the same. So it was a, it was a prank, but it horrified McNulty. Hundred percent, love that. Is he? You've been on tour all the time. Is was he, was he one of the biggest? pranksters is there any people who are absolutely known for that sort of thing uh a a lot of people of that era sam torrance tony johnstone the the legends of the game that are now in their 60s and 70s that uh that i've had the good fortune of uh of working with at the open this year we sat down for dinner each night and there's 10 or 12 of us around the table i I don't think eight of us said a word for two hours. We just listened to stories. That was the real prankster era. I don't think there's so much of it that goes on anymore. But um, That's one thing yeah. social media, right? Everyone's got their phone ready to yeah. record. You know something's up if someone's like, oh, let's get them going. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, we've mentioned, we're coming to uh, an end of episode one here. We mentioned there are a few events. So now let's try get a name of who's going to go well because I'm sure the casual golfer does like to sort of often have a little little flutter on, yep. on these events. So if we start over D- on DP World Tour, Ned Bank, you said the American big names may struggle. It's very different golf. Who's the who's the name to look out for this week, Aussie or otherwise? Okay, well, uh, I think Elvis Smiley, from memory, is the only Australian um, okay. competing, coming off the win a couple of weeks ago. But like I said, Nicholas Norgard, uh, the Dane, I, I'm not sure what price he is at the moment, but whatever price he is, he's going to be a good price yep. um, because I don't think he gets enough credit for just how talented he is and not only is he a long player he he plays well uh, different style of courses different conditions um so he's i think he's my pick for sure this week lovely okay that's and this field's always a bit easier because it's a full field right unlike the hero 150 much better odd, odds there and what about over uh, in the in the hero tigers event who, who are we liking there yeah well odds. i think uh, well i mean scotty scheffler is an obvious one right but three dollars that's not the best value keegan bradley uh, absolutely uh, he's had a win in Colorado at the BMW Championship three mm-hmm. or four months ago. He's he's just had a great 12 to 18 months, been very consistent. Uh, he just missed out controversially on making the Ryder Cup last time around. And uh, even though he'll be captaining the next Ryder Cup, I think he's got a little bit of a point to prove, a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and... Uh, He'll win the hero this week. There you go. Oh, you heard just, it here first. He will win. Perfect. Well, Norgard's still $34 in some places in uh, not a stacked field. That's pretty good going. Absolutely it is. Like that. Okay. Go. Maybe go and have a cheeky flutter. Maybe just go have, have, a, have a little look. Just yeah, see. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the tab. Um, beautiful. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty much covers off week one. We've had a look all over the world. We've got some stories out of it. We looked, And also, to say, also, in Australia, we've got one event, don't we, as well, down in... Uh, Victorian in, PGA Championship, Moonar yeah. Links. David Michaluzzi actually won it last year. And, and I think that actually... Uh, to a point that shows what the PGA Tour of Australasia have tried to do the past few years and that's just provide a pathway and a stepping stone to something greater which is the allegiance with the DP World Tour and um, David Michaluzzi is now playing the DP World Tour and uh, kept his card Um, so it really was a stepping stone for him. Who's going to win down there this week? Uh, you know the course clearly very yeah, well. I do. Yeah, anyone can win there, right? Um, <laughs> gosh, that was 16 years ago. I'm going to go with Corey Lamb. Corey Lamb, big fella from the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. Another good name. I, we're still just going good names winning. Yes. Corey Lamb. Finished second to Lucas Herbert alongside Cam Smith at the New South Wales Open Yep. Uh, three weeks ago now. Um, made the cut the last couple of weeks and uh, is in a purple patch of form. Look out for him. He's the one. Love it. Mick Luzzi's had a great... I think he, he won at Bonnie Doon, I think, last year. He did. Year. He won three times. Can't yeah. remember that third win, but incredible season. But what I now think he's going to be remembered for... Have you seen he's just set a new Guinness World Record? Oh, 134 yards. Is yeah. that right? He holed out a putt from 134 yards. That's the old team I used to work for, the sort of yeah. viral video side of things. Does that mean we don't have to see Michael Phelps's putt 
anymore. Several times a year at the Dunhill. At the Dunhill, every time. Michael Phelps from off it. I know he's a slightly bigger name, Phelps. I think. Well, not not letter wise, but the McCluzzy. Yeah. But in terms of um, yeah, medal and accolades. But that was pretty amazing from the middle of the fairway all the way it was Yas Links wasn't it I think yeah, it was, was. filmed at Abu, Abu Dhabi, Dhabi. Yep. Um, how would you have gone would you have liked doing those challenges by the way and all those the, the 14 club that we did and everything else the one that I respect the players for buying into the most is the 500 balls hole in one oh. uh, prize because I think from memory Eduardo Molinari was the first Correct. player to do it <laughs> yeah. and, and I remember Andy Sullivan riding the emotional roller coaster with him because I think he got it he he made yeah. a hole in one I think on like sh- f- yeah, 237 I think it was the ball we broke for lunch down at the London yep. uh, I've still got the ball the sign he kept it and gave it to me I don't know why he went I need a cider had lunch had a cider just after lunch yep. he held it chase the ace is what Ewan's talking about there we've done it a few times definitely check it out it's good fun but you break them it's 12 hours of basically just hitting the same shot over and over. And it's potluck holes in one. Absolutely. And I don't think any pro, no matter how uh, much you practice, would have ever hit 500 balls in a day. I've never hit more than 80 or 100. And to hit that many with the same club, the same shot, obviously some wind might pop up and you might have one or more or less, but... Yeah, from like to hole it is so damn hard. Yeah, dodo, you watch the like journey, and they all the fun thing with those. I did a few of them. They all think it's guaranteed. They're like, mm. of course I'll get it. Like it makes sense, but not in any way. And and actually at the Ned Bank we did it with Brandon Stone in thirty five oh, degree heat. I remember that elevated oh. tee. Um, and the poor guys running on had to fix every pitch mark and run back off for yeah eleven oh. hours. And with Brandon. He actually just kept going. He didn't want to stop. He's that competitive. Yeah, it was <laughs> unbelievable. He's still there, is he? He's, he's literally still there. And, and, you know, some managers, some of the bigger players didn't do it. So I did the one with Justin Thomas and um, Rory McIlroy. They, Scottish Open? Um, no, that was actually in Abu Dhabi. Okay. That one, but we've, we've done a few in Scotland. They gave us 50 balls each. That was enough of their time and warm up compared to 500. <laughs> See, um, as, as a golfer too, you start hitting a couple of bad shots and you start thinking, oh, what's wrong with my swing? Yeah. And then it just becomes a a complete mental thing as well, in addition to how totally. mentally fragile you already are doing yeah. it. And then that week, you're like, I've got 148 yards. You're like, I think I know the club. Yeah. I think I've got the distance <laughs> on this. And, no, then you, um, and then you go and get a hole in one during the tournament. And you hopefully win a car or something yeah. equally good. Um, on that, how many holes in one are we looking at from you? Uh, five, but I haven't had one for 15 years. Oh, really? Okay. Because yeah. that is a great amateur question, isn't it? Where there was like, how, how lucky... There was a two people this week, I think I saw, in, I want to say... Japan in just a club comp half to hole in the club champs with ones Without, yeah it really is a potluck thing though because my five hole in ones one of them was a really good shot the other four were they were alright but you know they just it, I didn't be able to say they were alright well they were, they were decent shots but they had no right going in they could yeah. have easily ended up 20 feet from the hole just yeah you have no idea thing. bounce spin wind anything gust yeah. it's, it's, it's potluck yeah. um, beautiful well thanks Ewan enjoyed that episode sorry. one we've just Tick that straight off. We've covered Oz. Next Keep week we'll look. Yeah, we'll look back next week at. Well, see if you know anything about tipping. That's the main thing overall. Yep. Did you notice I didn't give any names? I've just you know stayed on the back. There. Yeah, you're I'm sitting on gonna, the fence. Yeah. yeah, that's not like you. <laughs> not like me at all. Um, well, thank you for watching. As I mentioned, Instagram and Facebook is at the Fanatics and YouTube Fanatics TV, um, or go to thefanatics.com, the website where you can find all the merch, um, events coming up, and um, hopefully you know jump on a Fanatics tour around the world with like-minded sport fans um, supporting the green and gold uh, all over the world. Um, and of course, check out the other shows we've got. We've got Juice with tennis um, and Chin Music as well. Looking at the cricket, and it's a big time for Aussie sport all round. Um, I've been Ollie Silverton. You and Porter, it's a pleasure. Cheers, and, uh, Ollie. See you next week to uh, get a few more stories out of you. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Yeah. Move. Move. Thanks for watching Chipping In on Fanatics TV. Remember to like, Move. subscribe, Everybody. and we'll see you next time. <laughs>